Hi, welcome to, uh, thank you for showing up and welcome to my talk on how can we blend user research in the design cycle and why we should do that. So my name is Julien. I come from a game design, ba game design background and I know work at Ubisoft. I've been doing that for the past eight years uh, as a user researcher. And my, my job now is to work as the user research project manager of Rainbow Six Siege in Montreal. So user research project manager is the one, it's in Ubisoft is the, the role of defining the strategy of the user research on a specific project uh, to maximize the impact of the work we do and to make sure that uh, what we do as user researcher uh, fits the ne needs of the, of the team. Um, and before that, when I first started working at Ubisoft, I was uh, a junior researcher. I worked on games such as Assassin's Creed Revelation, um, then moved on to help on Splinter Cell Black Blacklist. And then as a more active researcher, like uh, main researcher on smaller game initially, like Duel of Champion, and later on, uh, on the first uh, The Division. And after that, I moved on to be the team lead of the Paris User Research Lab, the, the, the one we have uh, at Ubisoft Paris. And that was before moving to, as I mentioned, to work on Rainbow Six Siege. So I worked uh, on a lot of different projects, uh, sometimes from afar, sometimes from uh, while being very involved. I worked with uh, small teams, bigger teams, uh, smaller labs even in Ubisoft. And that gave me a perspective and, and I think a sense of uh, dynamic and issues that I observe across a variety of game and even teams. And just for context, uh, Rainbow Six Siege is uh, a first person shooter. It's a 5v5 PvP game that was released in 2015. Uh, it's very successful. We have 40 million players uh, around the world uh, and it's growing. Um, but to be honest, I'm not going to speak that much about Rainbow Six Siege. I'm going to speak about things that I think is a reality for everyone uh, to some extent, uh, some issues that we have to tackle as a discipline. And, uh, and I would love to explore with you and, and talk about that. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I think there is a value though in just having a, a chat about that. So what I think is the norm for most of us still. You have a game production um, that usually goes like this. Uh, you start uh, small and the more time goes, uh, the more the, the polish of the game, the more resources are involved on the game. Uh, and coincidentally, the decision making, uh, the ability of the team to change the game drastically decreases over time, right? That's usually how it works. On our side, we tend to follow the same pattern. We tend to be involved more and more as the time goes, as you get close to the release of the product. And that means that the return on investment, the impact of the work we do also decreases our time. <coughs> and this has, I think, some uh, negative uh, impact. Some, it creates some dynamics that are uh, not always the, the healthier. Um, one of which is this sometimes lead the user research to be seen and perceived as a grading system, a grading mechanism. Uh, we are very good at saying your game is great, here is why, or your game isn't great, here is why. But usually we do that at a point where they can't make drastic change and they can't really solve the issue we raised. And I know I've, I've been that, I, I, st I still see that. And moreover, this, this quickly creates uh, an unhealthy dynamic. It's, it's, it creates a loop where the, there is a lot of stress involved uh, on, on the work with us. Like people go into the test room, they are stressed. They are hoping that the results will be good because anyway, they can't make meaningful changes to their game most of the time. Uh, it's really when you have an exam and you just uh, are finger crossed and hoping that your results are good because it's done al uh, already, right? You can't change your, your exam. Um, and I, I believe that if the pr a process, an, in an interaction with uh, a discipline such as uh, ours is always stressful, something is wrong. Something 
I think has to change. And I think it's something, all, everything I mentioned is to some degree true for uh, a lot of, uh, for, for most of us. So how can we maybe do better? Um, the first part, I, first thing I'm gonna uh, discuss is how to change our mindset, how we see ourselves and how we position ourselves. The second is how to harm the iteration process because I think it's the key to alleviate the issue I mentioned earlier. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. And the third part is to how to become a consistent support at every step of the way. So first thing, um, we, when we talk about changing the mindset, uh, we often think about how the other are gonna perceive us. Um, but I think we should also think about how we see ourselves, how we frame the work we do and the discipline that we have. Because pa part of the issues I mentioned is how we present ourselves. Over the years, we've become very proficient, uh, very experts in doing that kind of job where we uh, give insights on the quality of a game. Uh, we, we, we are, we invested heavily in, in big structure, uh, fancy labs. Uh, we trained our junior, the people we work with, to be good at that, being able to chain a lot of tests back to back uh, and really uh, give a grading of the game. And that's what people see when they go in our lab, when they got, get to work with us, or when even when just when they interact with a user, user, sorry, a user research structure. And I think that paints us in a, like th uh, that frame us as being uh, kind of a firefighter, right? Because if you buy a fancy red truck, uh, nice red hat, uh, and you run around fighting, and, and you run around just pointing the fire, you're gonna be seen as a firefighter. And what I'm asking is, do we want to be the firefighters, or do we want to be the builders? Do we want to be the one that help the game grow? Do we want to be the one that help the vision of the designer come to reality and the experience of the player to improve? I think probably the reason, right? And while I was doing this, working on this presentation, someone asked me, how do I know if I am a, f a firefighter or a builder? And from my experience, things that I've experienced or seen people say or, or do, um, if I don't understand why the development team did a specific thing in, in my game, it's probably because I'm not positioned uh, yet to help them build their game. Uh, if I am frustrated because they did not fix that one big issue that I've been raising over and over again, probably because I'm not where I should be. And if you're not sure what changed uh, in your, on your game between two tests, same, you're probably up there pointing fires uh, and maybe not uh, working to, I don't know, build uh, a house that is fireproof somehow. On the other hand, if you're able to understand uh, what they did from one test to another, if you are part of the decision making to solve those issues, if you can, can go into the test room without, almost without chatting with anyone and know what you should do, uh, this is probably because, it's, it's probably a sign that you are on the right track. Sorry, I skipped the slide there. So, how do we change that? How do we move from firefighter to builder? Well, one thing I want to say is I don't think it's either or. There is not black or white, I think it's a gradient. Uh, you're probably gonna move from one to the other uh, on a production cycle. It's just, I think right now we are mostly firefighters and we have to work to be builder most, most of the time. So first, uh, first way to, to improve that is to see yourself as a wingmate rather than a judge. And I think it's, it's a, a, a pitfall that a lot of us fall into, which is to feel judgy about the game they are working on, uh, to, to say, all right, this not, does not make sense, they should not have done that. Uh, if you think like that, it's gonna be very hard for you to, to, to be a builder, right? The second, second part is being embedded. Uh, it's something that I've discussed at this summit over the years. I think it, is a, it has a tremendous value. Um, but I don't think it's enough. Like yes, sitting next to the people that make your game really helps. Uh, being part of the team is a huge facilitator, 
but it's not always enough. Uh, and I speak from my own experience, because uh, when I first arrived on Rainbow Six Siege, uh, we were about to ship a big PvE event called Outbreak, and I had the chance to sit right next to the team, be very embedded, uh, I had a great relationship with every everyone uh, down there, and despite having this access to the designer, I still ended up doing a bunch of feel-good tests, like tests that were mostly, well, the impact was mostly to say, all right, the game is, is good, the game is not good, but anyway, we can't change anything, we have to ship it, so not a huge impact. So changing the way you perceive ourselves is important, but it's not enough. The second part I want to explore is how to own the iteration process. Um, what do I mean by that? Usually, the user research process goes this way. You have a user test, a study, whatever kind of, of, of study you are making, and then you have another one. But what's happened between the two is not always very clear. Sometimes we don't know what's going on, and most of the time, I hope, it's not uh, extremely clear to us how things go from uh, one test to another, what changes are made on the game we are working on. And we have to fight that. We have to break the iteration black box. We have to get involved. We have to spend energy and time being better at working on that part rather than just chaining one test to another. This, is, this should be one of our focus. And there is two situations. Uh, there is two cases of black box. Uh, the first one is uh, where nothing happened. There is no iteration between two tests. I don't mean that nothing nothing happened, but usually you just have more polish going on, more implementation, less bugs. Uh, when you are in this case, us as researchers, we should get involved and we should create an iteration space. We should give the tools to the designer to think about this design, uh, to work on addressing the issue we raised. And this can take a lot of, of, of shape. Uh, this can be PlayStation, short studies, brainstorming, workshops, I don't know, but it's not more test, not necessarily that. It's working out of the test room with the designer, with the people that are making those calls to uh, address the issues. And otherwise, if nothing happened, might as well not do another test. And the second case is, which I hope is the mo most frequent, is something happened, but we are only partially involved in it. And in this case, uh, I think we should work and sp maybe spend a little less energy and time on the green blocks and make sure that this is supported adequately, uh, that they have the right tools to address the issue we raise and that we can help facilitate the decision process to address those issues. And I think this is user research too. This is as much as our job than the green blocks. Being in test room is fine but working with the people we, that are making the game to help them uh, make the game grow and the experience uh, b become better is as much a part of our job as the, as the rest. I'm gonna give you an example uh, of something that worked out well for us on Rainbow Six Siege, um, which are the PlayStation. Uh, so I know that the word PlayStation means a lot of things for different people, in our case, uh, the designer, on a weekly basis, uh, uh, came together to test the latest tweaks and changes they made to the game between themselves uh, to improve on the content, right? So it was good, um, but there were, there were some issues. The objectives were not very clear, like people would go into those sessions not knowing what they will be testing, uh, why will they be testing something. The organization was blurry because the workload was spread between three designers and it was not their job. So sometimes the sessions fell apart. You did not have the proper people at the proper time. Uh, things that are, I think, familiar uh, uh, for us. And f m lastly, but more importantly, the follow-up on the issues that were raised during those play sessions was, was not consistent. So we jumped in. We started treating those play sessions as we would for any user test, right? Uh, we, def we now define the objectives with the stakeholders. Um, we are the ones that organize the session, so uh, it's kind of our field of expertise, so things are running much more smoothly now. And we follow up on the findings, 
and we hold them accountable. At the end of each session, a decision is made on what should be the next steps, and we are the one to say, all right, a week ago you said you would do that, did you did it? And if not, we have a chat about why. Like maybe they don't have the resources, and in this case it's informus, we can say, all right, there is no, it's not necessary to work more on this content because they have no time to improve, or maybe they have a new issue, or maybe we can find a solution to help them explore the, the issues more. And I'm gonna do a quick parenthesis here about the difference between organizing and honing a process. Um, because I think we, are, we have different skill sets, uh, one of which is being good at organizing things, uh, such as user test, debrief, summit, uh, such as this one, party for the one after today, I hope. Uh, and that's all well, well and good, but we are not the only one on the production floor at being good at that. The one where we are, where it's very much our expertise is to understanding feedback, understanding players, and being able to formulate that into something that is cohesive and that people can work on. So this is what we should leverage. When we work on breaking those black buses, when we try to facilitate the iteration process, we have to be mindful about not being the nice guy or girl that is just here to make things happen. We have to be the one that say, all right, this is the feedback we got, what are you uh, uh, are gonna do about it? It's holding them accountable and making sure that they understand the issues properly. So when you are doing something, try to think what are you doing the most? If you are just facilitating, may maybe you are just, uh, maybe you are not uh, breaking that black box yet. And I mentioned the, the example of the PlayStation, which is the one that worked well for Rainbow Six, but I don't think that's the one that will work on every project. Every team and game is different. Uh, the point is just to leverage your skill set of researcher into facilitating that uh, iteration process. It's, it's working outside of the test room to make things happen. Uh, we are good at driving discussion usually, so uh, we can make the workshop, uh, a workshop happen on solving some specific issues. Uh, we are good at organizing and collecting feedback, so we should organize those PlayStation if it's relevant. Or uh, usually we have a pretty good view of the state of the game and the production, so we can even define and implement an, uh, an iteration process, process if there is nothing uh, happening. Uh, and if you take a step back, it's just about being creative and finding ways to support your team outside of the test room uh, moving away from a model where it's just user research on content that is ready to test to a point where we are uh, there at every step of the way where we, where we bring creative solutions that are custom made for the team we are working uh, with. Uh, and if you look uh, on another uh, side, it's, it's moving away from a, a process which is usually you do uh, a small test and then a slightly bigger one, and then a bigger one, bigger one, and just you spend more and more time and you're able to evaluate the experience uh, like more and more uh, completely to a, a, a system where we just uh, spread our resources evenly uh, between being in the test room, working outside of it, uh, making things happen. Because the, the thing I mentioned, like the, the PlayStation, the workshop, th this takes time and this takes energy and you have to have the time to think about how you can uh, custom, uh, cust customize that for your team. So if we are stuck in a process where, we are, we are, where we are just doing test and test and test, it's gonna be very hard to achieve. Uh, and on Ragon Six Siege, uh, it's a mix of PlayStation usually during conception phase with user tests uh, on um, on prototypes or, or very, very high stuff. Then we move on to the uh, production and we have uh, workshops with expert players, uh, then more PlayStation, then more user tests. And then we get to the point where we can have a live phase so we can, so we are also involved in, in helping the team leverage that feedback. And then after the, the content is shipped, we are involved uh, on, for example, the balancing of the content we just released, stuff like that. It's very specific to R6, but what my point is there is not a lot of green block there. We spend most of our time and energy to doing whatever is the most relevant, and it's rarely uh, strictly a user test. It's rarely strictly 
going in the test room and having users play. Sometimes it is because that's one of our main tools still, but it's not most of our job. And the third part is how to support consistently. So I think we all read, said, thought about this, test early, test often. And for some reason, I don't think it's still, it's not re the reality of most of it still. Um, so I think rather than just s focusing on testing early, we should uh, focus on being consistent, testing at every step of the way. Uh, once I've heard uh, a, game di a game director, uh, we, we just released a game with them. It, it was a very good cooperation. They really enjoyed our, our work. They were very happy uh, about it. Uh, and they were moving on to the conception of the next game. Uh, and he said to us, uh, we want to take a break from user research. And that's not quite right. Uh, what happened? It's not that they did not like us anymore. Uh, it was just that they wanted to have some time to fail on their own without us clipping their wings and, and just uh, giving feedback on content that was poorly implemented or not really figured out. So f for them, uh, we were an obstacle to that. And they were more than happy to work with us down the line, but for a, a, a period of time, they wanted to be on their own and have the time to try weird stuff that will probably fail. And I think that's the opposite of what we want. That's probably the, the worst thing that can happen. And how did, did that happen? Well, if you think about it, you have those late anxiety creating tests that I mentioned. Sorry. And this usually build a lot of tension, like people are going on in the, the test room and there is a lot of stakes because the game is close to ship, so we need to make sure the game is as good as possible. So this is not always fun for everyone. And this creates a reluctant, uh, re well, they, are, they become reluctant to, help to let us test when the design is vulner vulnerable. And it in turn, it means that they, they, they do not let us test early enough, which in turn brings us back to, well, we only test late, so they are anxious about the, their interaction with us, and it goes on and on and on. So how can we maybe break that? Uh, well, I th for me, the key is to remove the surprise effect uh, of what we do. Like, they should not go and hear our, our feedback and be completely floored. They, they should be, user research should be a small incremental thing that goes uh, during the whole development process. And I mentioned fighting the black boxes. I think it's a great way to fight that. Because if you are there during the test, between the test, and again and again, you, you this should create a, a more relaxed uh, relationship with them. And what does that look like is we have to move from a pattern that looks like this, where we usually work a bit earlier uh, in the production phase, or pre-production, sorry, conception phase even. Then a bit more in the middle, and most of our work is during the late stage of production, or even just production, because when you are in production, it's not the time to make big changes anyway. And we have to work to reach a point where this is how it looks, where our effort is spread evenly across all the stages. Uh, that might mean that might mean uh, stopping working at some point, because w as we mentioned, a lot of those end tests are not very impactful, and they also create a lot of anxiety, which means that this they see us as firefighters, which means that they don't, don't won't let us work on the early stuff. So we have to break that. Um, it's not easy, but uh, I think for me, we have to stop over committing to those big testing. It's not even big, it's just late. Uh, it's just testing the products what once it's mostly done, or even 80% done. And if you have no good impact left, uh, if you can't make a big impact on the project anymore, maybe you, can, you should move away from it, like work on something else. If you can't, it's fine. Like I don't think we will ever stop doing those. Uh, those tests that, that uh, are mostly there to make sure that the game is, well, in whatever state it is, really. 
but uh, we should not be afraid to, to move away from that. Because right now I feel that we are committed to that and that's prevent us from having you know, that brain space that allows us to do creative solution to help them at every step of the way. Um, and how did we move from the first model I mentioned to the second one on Rainbow Six Siege? Uh, well, when I first arrived uh, two years ago on the project, uh, we were in a situation where the there was no uh, no more uh, qualitative researcher assigned to the project for it just because the previous one moved uh, on to the design side of things. Um, so I was by myself for a while. We had an am amazing analytic team that work that was working uh, very very hard to gather a lot of data, but on on the more like user research like lab qualitative side of thing, it not much was happening. So aside from the heartbreak example I gave, uh, I choose to focus exclusively on uh, early conception stuff. Um, because I did not have the time to do everything, so I choose to do only prototypes and conception uh, rather than anything else. It was a bit scary at, fir at first, even for myself, because that meant that I could not test a content for months and it will go into the hand of our player uh, with me having not seen it for months. And that was kind of scary, but it was the only way to maximize the impact of my work, right? because uh, those early tests had much more impact than just uh, an evaluation test, right? And, and focusing on that had a, a lot of good side effects. Uh, the first is I learned as a researcher how to stop worrying about uh, those feel-good testing. Like I just focused on raw stuff, conception stuff, at the exclusivity of everything else, uh, which uh, meant that there was less, less surprises because we had the information very early on of the raw, like the raw uh, quality of the content. Sometimes it wasn't great, like it, we did not all, always had uh, amazing uh, features, but we knew from the get-go that the feature was so-so or good or bad uh, they will do what we, they could in the time they had remaining to improve on it, but we will not over-test something that could not be fixed anyway. And when we in, uh, brought in more people, when we grew the team again, we were able to keep that mindset, to, to, to focus on the thing that has the most impact, at the, and even if, if it meant uh, letting go on, s on some of those feel-good tests that I mentioned. And the end result of everything I mentioned, which is uh, fighting the black box, uh, being a consistent, consistent support at every step, uh, means that on Rainbow Six, we, we mostly work on small, agile blocks of research, like nothing big, small stuff, very custom. We, are, we adapt uh, every other week. All right, we are going to focus on this. The best way to address this issue is to have, I don't know, a user test, a play session, a survey to the player. We, we try not to to scale things too much in advance, we try to stay agile. Uh, we have no consistent support from the early prototype phase to post-launch. Uh, and overall, we have a much more relaxed uh, relationship with the team. They, they have feedback every week from us. Sometimes it's come from a PlayStation. Sometimes it's just our opinion based on everything we see. Sometimes it's a user test. But there is no big surprises, and they get the info at a point where they can still do something, and not when it's already too late. And one of the cool side effects is that we now have the same biotic pacing with the development process. They, they wait for us to give them feedback, we wait for them to say that, all right, we implemented the change we mentioned the previous week. And overall, this, it's not perfect by any means, but it's much more a healthy relationship, where we have a lot of impact at every step of the way. So, takeaways. Three things I would like you to take away from that presentation. Um, the first one is try to identify when you are mostly a fi firefighter, sorry, rather than a builder. Be self-conscious about it. If you are just moving around and say, all right, this is not great and nothing can happen to it, you're probably a mostly a firefighter still. Uh, fight the iteration black box. And if you can, hone the iteration process. And b by hone, I mean that you, you may be the one that say, 
this should be tested, this is how it should be tested, uh, and this is what you guys should focus on. And if you do that, I think that you can become a consistent support at every step of the way, which will in turn break that cycle of anxiety that I mentioned, uh, and make the whole process and the whole relationship with your team uh, easier, more impactful, and more enjoyable for everyone involved. So that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> if we have tav time for question, I think. Yeah, we have a few times. Cool, amazing. Oh, this one. Yes, there is a mic up there. Questions? Hi. Um, so my personal background as a UX researcher is more in web design. Mm -hmm. I haven't done gaming yet, but um, I have a similar experience with um, usually product owners or product managers thinking that they can only do we can only do usability tests at the end of the design phase yeah. when we want to be in the beginning of the yeah. design phase because there are certain questions that need to be answered at certain phases in the design cycle and um, we had certain ways of um, socializing this we gave presentations because yeah. we found when we told um, so so project managers would think that um, they need to have a perfect prototype mm -hmm. that it looks exactly like it's gonna look so we can test okay. it and we're like no no we just need post-its um, and they were really happy when we told them yeah. that they need post-its but they don't come to us until it's too late yeah, sure. because they don't know that we only need post-its or we don't need fancy prototypes. So how do you socialize it across the organization that you can do fast, quick research with very low artifact? So I think for us, uh, we had to show them that we could do it. Uh, they were reluctant at first, as you described. We had to do a test saying, all right, we're gonna do this thing whether you want it or not uh, on our side. <laughs> And if you don't like the result, we will not do it ever again. Uh, obviously, we it, it, it turned up great, and we were we knew it would work that way. But uh, you have to show them. Uh, and yeah, the, the the hard part I think is to to stop them from polishing too much uh, because otherwise it's too late and you can't change anything. And it's very hard for a designer not to do it. But uh, as I mentioned, the more we did it, the more they learned to be fine with that. Like they. No, they are the ones that are proactive and saying, all right, I have these weird prototypes that I would like to you do to evaluate, to give a look at. <coughs> but that started with, uh, yeah, starting sh doing a little bit of research, showing that it could work. And, and over time, this creates a relationship where it's relaxed, people are f familiar that they can give you very early stuff, or even, as you mentioned, post it, uh, and that will turn out great. Hi, uh, you mentioned a bit about workshops as a way of yeah. incorporating yourselves into the iteration process. Can you speak a bit about um, how and if you worked with Dev to make those workshops and a little bit about what they were about or how you ran them? So in our case, it's mostly PlayStation. I feel adjusting the workshop might be a way to go if you can't have your content in the hand of uh, the pl uh, of Dev team really all the time. Uh, what you're looking at, I think, is to help them converge to a solution. So, I don't know, I've been to a few of those. Usually they go uh, like in all direction. Uh, they it's kind of a ballpark thing. Uh, and I think we just have to apply our workshop uh, experience. So, like helping them converge, uh, reminding them the stakes at different steps of the workshop, uh, remembering the issue because we are the one that know them the, the, the most usually because we found those issues in a user test. So. We can be the one that organizes the workshop. We can make uh, it happen, and we can, can, as is as with any workshop, we should be the one that makes sure that at the end we answered the question we had at the beginning. So just be kind of a driving force at every steps of the workshop. Um, another you mentioned about striving for a stress-free relationship with designers. Do you think that having someone in the UX team that's also familiar with things like coding, art, uh, similar stuff, would be pr uh, could help 
to develop that that stress-free relationship between the UX team and the design and development team? Sure. Uh, I think having AI of any shape and form is amazing, right? Having people that know your reality is a great help. Uh, I think it's not m mandatory, but it helps, yeah. Um, having, pe having people that are that have different backgrounds it helps. On R6, we are, we are lucky to have a designer, as I mentioned, that used to be, well, me, basically. Like he, he was doing my job before. Um, that helps a lot. Uh, obviously, not everyone has that. Um, but I think it can still happen even if you don't have those allies. Like we, we have a lot of team where no one know what we do. So we usually, as I mentioned, we, we do a small test with them. Uh, we have uh, the legitimacy now to, and as, as that was mentioned this morning, we have the legitimacy to try stuff. Like people won't be, I think, as scared as we think. Uh, we, we can try, try stuff, show them that it works, and build a relationship based on that, even when we don't have the ally we, you mentioned. Question? Yep. Oh. Um, so you mentioned have, making sure that there's no surprises in the early iterative testing and stuff. And um, how do you balance the line between like making sure that your designers are informed about what's happening in the research and also having innovative and like informative research findings? Uh, so that's interesting. We tend to not discuss much about the how we will conduct the research. Uh, after a while, they trust us on choosing the right methodology. Sometimes we come up with very creative solutions. Uh, I think after a while, you start, you, s you stop discussing that much about that. They just want the results. And when you reach that point, uh, I don't think it, it will be, uh, they won't slow you down because uh, they want you to justify every methodological choice you make. So it's just a matter of building that trust earlier, early on, and when you have that trust, uh, try stuff on your own and just show them the results. There was another question here, I think. Oh, there is another one now. So you talked a little bit about kind of breaking out of that black box area in between testing. Um, how, what did you find was most helpful to kind of get the devs and the design teams to actually be willing to talk more in depth, especially in a AAA environment when things are moving so quickly, they sort of get the results, read the report, or have the debrief, and then move on, and you just don't hear anything back from them. What is the, probably the most beneficial thing you found to kind of breaking through that barrier? Uh, following them. Uh, <laughs> just going where the decision will actually take place. After, uh, I could ask, uh, I was able to ask a director or a designer, all right, can I jump in just to see how you guys are doing that? And that's when you realize that things are sometimes more hazy than they should, and that's when you think, all right, maybe I could help. Uh, and that was the example of the PlayStation, right? Like, they, they, they were doing their things on their own. We went in there, uh, had a good look at it, and after a while, we chatted with the production manager, and they were more than happy to help them s uh, give more structure. Uh, they are always happy about structure, so it's like it was easy for us to jump in that. Uh, and after that, they realized that we were applying the same techniques that we have when we interview players, then basically to discuss with them. S so everything runs, runs smoothly and just, yeah, just be, like, follow them for a while, see how it works, and think how you can jump in that and make it better. Two more questions. Uh, Hi, yeah, so basically, um, you know, because you're talking about, you know, being involved, you know, as early as possible, you know, in the, the, the design cycle, uh, what I would like to know is because of that, oftentimes, you know, people will be kind of um, a bit reluctant knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, oh, but it's super early, we know that this is not going to work, this is not going to work, yeah. uh, we know about that, and even when they do accept, you know, you know, getting you involved, you know, in this, even afterwards, you know, when we come up with the results and then we start the conversation, you know, about, you know, what we discovered and what, you know, should be done and whatever, uh, we still have that, you know, dismissal a little bit, you know, about like, yeah, but we know that, like, this is too early or we know this, we know that. So how do you approach that to make the conversation a bit more and the relationship a bit more productive? And also how do you follow up on those things, you know, that maybe early on they don't feel maybe comfortable or willing to talk about? So maybe they are not ready to have user looking at their thing, like, they are probably actually ready, but they don't feel ready. So I would suggest that you 
work with them to make them having a look at their own work between like you know between designer between ux designer and if you help that happen during the conversation you can say oh maybe we could show that to real users that should be fine and maybe that will help you know get in that and create uh, an environment where they are ready to get feedback and if they really are, are not ready to get it like it's you sh probably n should not force it uh, it's weird like at once the user is involved suddenly the, the feedbacks uh, get kind of a sacred quality to it, like it, it's just it become the holy world of the player. But you can have the same discussion between designer and it's just as helpful. So I would suggest to, rather than bring the scary users, uh, just make them test their own things between themselves, uh, organize, uh, I don't know, uh, facilitate and make happen a, a workshop on a specific thing where they look at each other's work or they test each other's work uh, and maybe after that you involve internal user and then you jump to the real user um, and if you do that once maybe the next time they will accept the users a bit earlier i hope one last question maybe no We're good thank you very much